Good afternoon and welcome back to the fourth session of the Santander International Banking Conference. With less than a week to go before the US vote, our distinguished panelists will discuss the political outlook and what is at stake in these historic elections. They will examine global geopolitical prospects, their role for the European Union, and the reset of relations with China. We have named the session Democracy, the US Election, and the Transatlantic Alliance. Moderated again by James Harding, in today's panel we have Jim Messina, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff, former Foreign Minister of Spain, Ana Palacio, Samantha Power, who was US Ambassador to the UN, Dominique de Villepin, former Prime Minister of France. I can't wait to hear the debate, which will no doubt be fascinating. Today we have almost 4,000 people registered for the conference. Please use our web page or our app with its interactive features, including a window in which you can send questions to the panelists. Below that, you'll see a panel called Voting for Surveys. James will ask a few questions to you, so please do participate. Again, thank you for attending. We hope you enjoy this panel. And James, over to you. the exam question, the future of the world. So we're going to try and get at least part of the way through it. As you say, we are in this extraordinarily lucky position where we're joined by Ana Palacio, as you said, the former Spanish foreign minister, by Dominique de Villepin, the former uh, uh, prime minister of France, by uh, Samantha Power, um, who was the US's ambassador to the United Nations under Barack Obama, and Jim Messina, who's a political advisor and also served uh, in the Obama White House. Uh, and there's so much to tackle, but it seems uh, impossible to do anything but but look to Tuesday. And so we're going to start there, if we might, Jim, with you. Um, uh, I appreciate, Jim, this is your birthday, so it's a particularly unfair day on which to ask you an impossible question. I'm going to ask you instead three impossible questions. One is, what do you think the outcome will be on Tuesday? Two is, when will we know the outcome from the Tuesday election? And thirdly, what do you think it will mean? So James, thank you for those three very hard questions. Some 130 hours before the polls close uh, in America uh, and the entire world kind of waits to see what we're doing. I wanna start by just taking it in a broader context, which is, it is a fair question to ask, and I know my distinguished panelists will answer the question of what the heck is happening in the United States? And, and it really is a broader question of what's happening in the world right now. Mm. <clears throat> We've done races in 12 countries in the past five years. And what you're seeing is the rise of populism and nationalism. And that is, you know, that is what you saw, James, in your home country of the UK and Brexit. That's what we saw in the rise of Donald Trump. And that has really changed American politics. And it has changed American politics uh, in a couple ways. Uh, and President Trump is a reaction to that, mm -hmm. but you know he is a he is a symptom. He's not the cause, and the cause is this you know this fair economic anxiety voters have around the world about what is the future, what is the future in a world where tech creates jobs and, and may take away jobs. What this generation of voters around the world are the first generation who thinks that their their livelihoods are going to get worse than their parents. Mm -hmm. Traditionally in America, you know, we have the American dream, and now voters no longer see that American dream. And so they've been going back and forth between the parties, trying to find an answer to a very hard question, which is where is the future economically? And if you think about this campaign at the beginning of the year, pre-pandemic, you would have said President Trump was on track to be reelected. Mm -hmm. Now there's a saying in politics, you can survive one big problem if you're an American president. President Obama survived his, his economic challenges that he inherited, uh, and he was able to win a re-election that was very difficult. President Trump is really trying to do survive three unparalleled problems. Uh, the first is a biggest recession that we've had in a decade. Nine presidents have run for re-election in a recession. Eight of them have lost, only in 1924, when not even James and I were alive then, uh, uh, to, to see that incumbent win. Um, so eight incumbents row have lost during a recession, and this is the problem President Trump finds himself in. The second challenge he has is the worst racial unrest we've had in America in 50 years. Black Lives Matters took racial issues from not mattering to swing voters to now being the second most important issue to swing voters. And then the third, of course, is our first pandemic in 100 years. Mm 
mm -hmm. uh, or at least it was the, the biggest pandemic we've had in hundreds of years. Um, and the race has really become about who can get us out of this pandemic problem. And President Trump has been unable to get the campaign back to where he needs it to be, which is the economy. Mm -hmm. And so even with those three huge challenges, we still had a close American election. And, you know, I threatened to fire my staff in campaigns if they look at polls, because I think that all polls are garbage. And I got in trouble about six months ago because I said that all pollsters should be shot. And Samantha, you will appreciate that Fox News then said, Jim Messina says they should kill all political people. And I didn't say that, <laughs> I said pollsters. Um, and part of the reason is I think that these polls are just garbage. But, you know, the only way to look at polls is kind of average all of them. And what mm -hmm. is true is in a national average, uh, Joe Biden has about a seven point lead. And a reminder that America is now the most partisan country in the world, mm -hmm. meaning we have less swing voters than any country. Only about eight to 10 percent of Americans could really consider voting for both Trump and Biden. The other 90 to 92 percent decided six months ago. And because we changed our rules in the middle of this whole thing and allowed people to early vote because of the pandemic, we don't need to look at the polls. We know that as of this morning, um, some 78 million people have already voted. That's over half of the number of voters that we're going to have overall. Mm -hmm. We're also likely to have the largest presidential turnout of our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that James, matters in some of these. Sorry, James. Oh. No, I was just going to ask you, just because that's the one thing I suppose all of us are actually able to see today is the, the, the level of postal and early voting. Yes. Are you able to tell who those people are and how they are likely to have voted? How much can you tell about that 78 million? It's a great question. So every morning, the Secretary of State, which are the people who count the votes in American uh, local elections, issued a list of everyone who voted. And so you know that Samantha Powers voted. And both campaigns, the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign, will then run it through their very sophisticated models and be able to predict how Samantha Power votes. Mm -hmm. And so we can start to kind of figure out who is voting. And right now, the lead is huge for the Democrats. And it's the lead for the Democrats for two reasons. Because President Trump has told his supporters to wait until Election Day, except for in Florida. So that is why you see so much kind of bullishness for the Democrats right now, because the numbers are so big. Um, but we also can tell that both parties are incredibly motivated. We're going to see record turnout of both parties. And that is why, although uh, Biden leads in the national polls, in some of the state polls in the states that are really going to matter, like Florida and I, like North Carolina, like Georgia, they're very, very close. Mm -hmm. That said, this is not a national election. This is an election for 270 electoral votes. And just looking at the states today, you would say that Biden is the, is the prohibitive favorite to get to 270 electoral votes. And Jim, will you just tell us then about when we will know? Because you mentioned some of those states and, you know, Pennsylvania, everyone looks closely at Pennsylvania, but the count in Pennsylvania is not going to be done on the night of the 3rd of November, is it? You are correct. This is why everyone who's watching and going to watch American politics needs to have lots of liquor for election night. <laughs> because it is going to, you know, I prefer red wine, usually Spanish. <laughs> um, and, and I think, sorry, Dominique, um, and, uh, and it's going to be a long time unless, because to James's point, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, which are the three states that elected Donald Trump to the presidency, he carried those three states by a combined 77,744 votes, which is less people than are in Real Madrid or Barcelona's soccer stadium this weekend. Mm -hmm. So, but because we have so much early vote, the state laws in those states don't allow them to start counting those early votes until mm -hmm. after the polls are closed. And so to James's point, we're not going to know. Um, we're going to have some good indications. We're going to know some of the counties. But in the Midwest, we're probably not going to know till the next day. There is a chance, though, that you can all drink a lot early um, because Florida will come in very, very quickly. And North Carolina will come in very, very quickly. And if Biden wins either one of those states, there is no chance that Trump can win the election. Every night we run 66,000 simulations of the election 
And there is no simulation where President Trump can lose North Carolina or lose Florida and still win the White House. So it's, it's either, the so clear, it's either North Carolina or Florida. Correct. So, it's just, he's got to hold both of them. So, so, um, so Jim, I, wa I want to come back to talk about what happens afterwards and the implications for, if you like, Trumpism uh, the, for the Democrats, you know, the, the following day, November the 3rd and beyond, November the 4th and beyond, sorry. But, but, but Dominique, just, just listening to Jim, it's really striking how actually before you even got into the electoral arithmetic, Jim, the real point you were making was about the, the strength, the continued strength of populism and nationalism, the difficulties that governments are having in delivering what their people need and, and the push for change elections. And Dominique, I just wondered, without getting into the prediction business, what you think is the meaning of what's happening in the United States? Well, of course, the, the, the challenge is uh, very high and very important for the world community. But I wonder at this very moment if this election is as important that it has been in the past hmm. because of the decline of the U.S. leadership. Uh, Joe Biden uh, is going to have tight hands on many foreign policy issues. Just to take one very important example, which is the relationship with China. I believe Joe Biden or Donald Trump, both of them, are going to still continue on the verge of a competition with China, even confrontation with China. So they are going to have approximately the same policy. Concerning the policy towards Europe and the allies in Asia, I wonder whether Joe Biden might not bring an illusion for Europeans as well as allies in Asia or in the Middle East, an illusion to come back to something that looks nice at the time, but that has no meaning anymore today. The world has changed. The power of China is a fact, but more than that, we see an imbalance between liberal democracies and authoritarian regime. And my feeling, whenever I travel around the world, is that, and this is a very strong paradox, many illiberal democracies might look more appealing than liberal democracies that look divided and inefficient. Mm. Donald Trump has not cared much about the rest of the world during his presidency. And already we have seen the same trend for Barack Obama, even if of course, there were some important differences on climate change, on peace issues around the planet, but already the motto of Barack Obama was leading from behind. So the leadership of the US, I don't believe we will come back to what a lot of people had in mind in the past. So at the end of the day, the big question today is, is the new president, whether it's Trump or Biden, going to choose cooperation or confrontation? I think whoever wins in the US, there's still gonna be a lot of confrontation spirit in the US foreign policy in the coming years. Dominic, it feels to me as though we could take this conversation now in two ways that would keep us talking from here until Tuesday anyway. One is the state of liberal democracies, and then the other is the, the architecture of the world and, and multilateral leadership, and particularly the US's role in it. Let's try and do a little of both. So I'm going to come to Samantha first, just on the question of US leadership. Samantha, and I'm going to come back to this question about illiberal and liberal democracies. Samantha, when Dominic talks about a longer term trend in US leadership in the world, do you, do you broadly agree that, that the idea that we once had of the US's place in the world, and particularly its leadership of the West, is a thing of history? Um, I'm trying to think if there were any words in, in what he said that I agreed with. I think, <laughs> I think I agreed with the word Biden. There was a word, <laughs> I agree with the existence of these individuals and these uh, countries and entities. So let me, let me try to pull back. Um, so one of the, the points that was made, which is right, 
is that there will be competition and confrontation with China. Uh, that is not an American phenomenon. That is a phenomenon rooted in really profound differences in terms of how the international order should be structured. You can look at that in terms of trade practices, intellectual property. You can look at it as whether uh, or not military expansion, whether on the Indian border and in the South China Sea is appropriate. You can look at that in terms of building concentration camps and locking up a million, between a million and two million Uyghurs. But there are sources of confrontation in this relationship for sure. And frankly, if those weren't also sources of potential confrontation uh, for European publics and leaders, I'd be even more worried than I am. Mm. So that's not an American phenomenon. That really is about uh, not the abstraction of illiberalism, but a, a set of really profound differences that are going to help shape the US-China relationship, but also the relationship between China and much of the rest of the world. The second thing is this idea that Joe Biden is going to be an illusion. No, it's not illusory to say, actually, that you have respect for Western European democracies. It's not an illusion to say you're going to remain within NATO and try to make it more fit for purpose from within. It's not an illusion uh, to believe that you're in a stronger position, both to, to have confrontation and competition, but also to cooperate with China, which is something the former prime minister left out. You'll be in a much stronger position to do that if you are transparent, accountable, respectful uh, of your allies in Europe and in the Pacific. And the approach that Donald Trump has taken is, yes, tons of confrontation and competition, some of which is inevitable, uh, but doing so with one or maybe even both hands tied behind America's back by extorting the Republic of Korea uh, and sort of saying, if you don't do this on trade, I'm going to pull our troops out. Uh, by informing the Japanese public and the Japanese government of our plans for the Pacific by tweet and often changing our mind uh, overnight. No predictability, no constancy, no sense that America's word that came before is one that can be relied upon and thus grave doubts around the world about whether when America gives its word again, that word uh, can be counted upon. So that's just to respond to what was said. I think the climate was mentioned. That's another mm -hmm. word concept I agree with. But climate is not an afterthought. Climate is the reason that the a Biden administration, uh, it, it's the sort of first order top tier reason that to reduce the US-China relationship merely to competition and confrontation is not conceivable. But it's not just climate, it's also the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and the recognition that none of us are going to be able to get our lives back to normal, not only until we have a vaccine to take care of our citizens, but uh, until the hotspots stop raging elsewhere in the world. And that's going to require a massively ambitious vaccine distribution uh, plan and intense collaboration, uh, whether within international organizations that Joe Biden would return to and Donald Trump will continue to walk away from. I don't have, not only do I know that Donald Trump would leave NATO in a second term, I don't have confidence that he would keep the United States and the United Nations in a second term. Mm -hmm. So this idea of equivalence between uh, a leader who wants to ground U.S. leadership in the world in values, who recognizes pragmatically that in 2020 our fates are connected to the fates of people who live around the world. It's a kind of a, an axiom to every European, mm. but it's actually a controversial proposition in the United States that divides uh, the, the leaders mm. of the two parties. Believing that we that returning to international institutions, that not dictating within those institutions and returning with great humility in light of what has happened and what can happen again in America uh, and recognizing that, that whether it's competing, confronting, or co cooperating with China, that we are much, much stronger standing with our allies. Uh, Samantha, thank you. Dominic, before I come back to you, I, uh, and I suspect we're going to end up in quite a profound argument about how the world is run and the institutions as well as the individuals that run the world, uh, I want to hear from uh, Anna Palacio because, uh, Anna, I'm, uh, I'm intrigued and I have to say, even shocked, I'm embarrassed by my naivety to think that both NATO and the UN might be in play in a second Trump term. What do you think about the point that, that, that Dominique and Samantha were 
discussing there, which is the nature of US leadership and the machinery through which that leadership is conducted? Well, um, first of all, I think that we Europeans sometimes, and on this Dominique de Villepin is right, we think that we will go back to the good old days. And frankly, the rosy Im image that we have about the good old days, because the relationship has never been smooth. There have always been transatlantic differences. And this has made this, this, this uh, I mean, this relationship interesting and, uh, and just worth it. Uh, but honestly, I don't agree with him, having said that, because, okay, Samantha Powers has said it, and it is very important. If Biden wins, we can, we as Europeans can expect three important things that are uh, inversely proportional as they are uh, provocative. The first thing is just manners. I think that in, 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 our, in our daily lives, manners matter. Being rude, as Trump makes a point of being rude, matters in international relations. If you just go transactionalist, then you are going to the bare bone. And these relationships are very difficult to maintain in, in the long run on this transactionalist. So manners may not seem important. It's hugely important in diplomacy and in, in relations in general. Second, I think that we, I mean, we will have predictability. Biden has, uh, Biden, Trump has boasted about being unpredictable. And, and frankly, this is very heavy on allies because we don't know where we stand or what to expect. And this just unravels this, mm. this, this alliance or this transatlantic alliance. The third thing, and again, I disagree with Dominique de Villepin, of course, we United States is still the indispensable nation in a different way than when uh, Madeleine, pa uh, Madeleine, uh, Madeleine Albright uh, said it in 94, was it? Because the world has changed. That is absolutely clear, and he's right. Mm -hmm. But the only nation that has convening power, we Europeans, we can help, we can contribute, we can, uh, we can just, in dialogue with the United States, help this bringing back to the, of the United States to the multilateral institutions to a more cooperative. But the only, the only democratic nation that, that can convene mm -hmm. the, from, I, from Japan to Korea to the Europeans is the United States. And this would be a different leadership. It would be a 21st century leadership. And allow me just one comment on us Europeans. Yes. Allow me. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, we cannot fool ourselves. We cannot, we are not neutral between China and the United States. We cannot sit on the fence. This, uh, this uh, idea of the Sinatra doctrine, we Europeans, we go our way. I, we go my way between United States and, and China. This is absolutely nuts mm -hmm. because we share, and this is what is at stake in this in this world of today, we share values and principles. And this is not just words. This is, we have proven how these values and principles are a force for good from the Atlantic Charter to the, to the Marshall Plan. And, and, and this is there. And I, ju I just want to ask you though about one thing, just picking up on Samantha's point, and then I'm coming back to you, Dominique, which is, I read a column of yours, I think it was in El Mundo, which was about what are the mechanisms for making that transatlantic relationship work? And I, I'm just struck by, I was struck particularly by this idea that you had that we have neglected, if you like, the second tier multilateral organizations, your oh, WHOs yeah. and your FAOs. And, your, and, and I wonder whether or not, given the pandemic, given the fact we are really focused on health and food security, and as Samantha was just touching upon, climate, there, there, there's a potential to rebuild cooperation, not necessarily around those big shiny organizations like NATO and the UN, but some of the, the subsidiary organizations that have perhaps been neglected. Well, uh, let's hope that the, this divide between Ngozi Okonjo Wella mm -hmm. and the Korean candidate that now today, the, uh, the Trump administration 
announce that they favor is overcome by the election. Mm -hmm. Well, I fully agree with you. The, the evidence is how many times have we heard about the Security Council lately? Mm -hmm. Ne none, no, it has absolutely disappeared. What is mm -hmm. important today is the, the, the sectorial, the specialized agencies, and this is where things are happening. We could discuss why, and we could discuss United Nations, and on this, I just refer to Samantha Power, that is the one that knows. But the evidence is that, uh, I mean, the IDP, the Inter-American the, the Inter Development Bank, has been an issue of the campaign, not the reform of the United Nations, not leaving the United Nations, not having an American heading this uh, second tier, even third tier organization. I think that this is extremely important and this would be understood by a Biden administration. And there we can collaborate and we can collaborate with Latin America as well, as I mentioned IDB. Right, let me, let, let me go back to Dominic because in, in one way, it is the good old days, Dominic, which is that there are a lot of people ranged in argument against you. <laughs> it's, a, it's, I'm sure, a feeling you know well. But, but I, I understand perfectly and it's, it's normal. My belief, is that there is no way we can come back to the old days because the system and the balance of forces has changed. So if we don't rethink the international system, which has to be rebuilt, and that's why I feel that most of the proposals on the table coming from the Biden administration, and it's of course the same from the Trump administration, are a little thin. They lack substance. I don't see the vision. I see the rival, the enemy, China. I see the very strong rivalry with Russia. I see how they want to put on the side many emerging countries because of their political system. But I have the feeling that that does not make a world policy. That does not create a world leadership. Because at the end of the day, you need much more to be able to lead everybody. And if you are going to lead only half of the world, while the other half is getting stronger and stronger, and we should understand that, most of our people, and that's a very strong point, I believe, are doubting on our capacities. And I will say the same in Europe as in the US. And that's why the good old days are not going to come back because our people is divided between the people and the elite. Our people and the US people are divided. People supporting Joe Biden today are very divided. And I don't know what kind of policy is gonna come up after the election. And maybe we will have surprise in the capacity to implement uh, a new policy because of the division among this very heteroclight coalition. So, the US has come from a liberal democracy to a mass democracy, which is organized through coalition, with passions, with a very strong look inward. And I feel, whenever I go to the States, that they don't look enough to the rest of the world. They don't understand how much the world has changed. They don't understand the attraction of many newcomers, China, Russia, Turkey, on many emerging countries. And if we don't take that into account, if we are not able to lead through example, because I can see, yes, of course, a human rights policy, that's good old days policy, but how effective is it in our countries? People are looking at what we're doing in our own countries. Are we setting an example in terms of the perfect democracy, I'm not sure. So that's why I consider that the capacity of leadership of the US depends very much on the capacity to change its vision of the world and to lead into a new world which has to be invented. And the same goes through uh, for the Europeans, which are very much divided, North and South, East and West, very much divided between the people and the elite, and our democracies do have a problem. Trump has been elected, and the reason why he has been elected is still true today. Mm -hmm. So if we don't take the lesson, if we just go back with Joe Biden to the 
what was the United States four years ago. We will make the biggest mistake in forgetting what has made Donald Trump U.S. president. And if he's going to lose tomorrow, if he's going to lose, I don't think it is because of the qualities and attraction toward Joe Biden. I think it is because people will reject Donald Trump. But that's something else. Maybe the problems will still be there. Dominic, I, I, I want to come back to your idea of building something new and what that capability might be. But Jim, can I can I just ask you to follow up on what Dominic is saying? Because I suppose there are a couple of questions that are obvious. One is, it would a Biden victory represent a return to, if you like, old norms? And and whether it does or it doesn't, what happens to these questions of division and polarization within the United States? Um, can you sort of take us forward beyond the election? Yeah, look, I would associate myself with Ambassador Powers' remarks. I mean, I think there there is going to be some things that are going to continue, to Dominique's point. Um, the competition with China will absolutely continue. Um, but I think Biden will want to reassert old relationships in a way that I think is more both in his interest, and remember, I worked for him in the White House. I've served in the Senate for 20 years with him. I understand who he is, and he believes in the, the global relations that Anna was talking about, and he will spend time trying to do those things. I think that what is true is Joe Biden's candidacy or win is not going to reunite America. We are split. We are divided 50-50. We are divided on very big questions about our future and we are that partisan. Um, that said, um, you know, you can't just say it's Donald Trump's gonna lose on Tuesday because he's a jerk. Donald Trump's gonna lose on Tuesday because it's a referendum on him and he's a failed leader and that's what voters think. 60-40 um, think he's been a failed leader and they think Joe Biden can heal the country. And one of the things Joe Biden's gonna have to do to heal the country is return us to some norms that the ambassador was talking about. But I suppose, I guess what I'm interested in, Jim, is that this election is going to be, in the way you framed it, a response to that respect, recession, a response to the um, social justice Black Lives Matter protests, response to the pandemic. Some people would, would interpret it as another rejection election, another moment where the public has said, we don't want you in charge. And, and I wondered whether or not going back to your very original point about populism and nationalism, and with an eye to the fact, I think, I think you've advised sort of a dozen or more prime ministers and presidents in other countries, whether or not you see that same pattern happening elsewhere, and whether that speaks to the point that Dominique made earlier about the weakness of liberal democracies. Well, look, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm, I'm cynical as to the weakness he's talking about. What is true is liberal democracies have real challenges in front of them and have yet to sort of move forward a vision for the future on how you create jobs, why internationalism matters, how how you should, the average voter should think through these things. What is needed is some of the policy work that I think we all agree on to have sort of a vision of where we take this. And I think, you know, for the two Americans on the phone, I think you're hearing both of us say, we understand that there are real challenges in the United States, but you know, a Joe Biden win will take us to a place where we are engaged in world uh, conversations, mm -hmm. and we're engaged in those conversations that include things like what does an economic future look like in a liberal democracy, mm -hmm. and that is something that all of my clients are struggle with around the world, because the kind of post Bretton Woods internationalism. This is the one place I'm going to associate myself with Dominique. Um, I'm not, you know, everything else, I think the, the ladies just tore him apart. But on this point, <laughs> I agree um, that that there does need to be a where are we going next, mm -hmm. because Joe Biden winning won't return us to the good old days. It is just a step in dealing with these things that all of us in liberal democracies see every day. So, so Samantha, will you just flesh out for us. I was really struck by what you said about climate being top tier for Biden. And I know we're making a presumption here to Jim's point, 
you don't know whether the, what the pollsters tell you is true. But one of the things, given the noise of the election, that's really difficult to understand at a distance, is what the intersection of, of US domestic politics would be on its foreign policy in the event of a Biden election. And so you mentioned climate, but I'm sure there are other things. I wonder whether you could spell those out. I can try. If I may just, just pick up on one of the prior themes and then I'll come to that, James. Just, mm. I, I, I do think that um, we should, before any discussion starts, kind of have a, a, a set of stipulations. So the first stipulation in this conversation is nobody is saying that we can go back to the way life was four years ago. Right. Nobody is saying we're going to go back to the moment where the Berlin Wall fell and the U.S. was the sole superpower. The U.S. has transitioned out of a period of domination and sole superpowerdom into a position now of an equivocal relationship even to leadership. So the question before us is, is the U.S. even prepared, as, as uh, uh, Anna was saying, is, is, is the U.S. prepared even to play that catalytic role, that convening role, uh, to stand up for shared values, to try to strengthen international institutions, maybe from within, or maybe to build new networks, new coalitions, and so forth. So I just think, let's get the straw men out of yeah. the conversation oh, yeah. and, and go where you want to go, James. Then the second point is, there is a way in which, and, and this isn't just the former prime minister does this, but this, the, the, the way in which we talk about China as if it has no domestic politics, as if, as if it has no internal challenges, right? Mm. Democracies are the only ones riven uh, by division, by structural weakness. Uh, and believe me, again, another one of the stipulations is, are democracies in deep trouble? Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. We're split down the middle. We can't agree on basic science and basic facts, stipulate. But let's not forget the brittleness as well of the China model. Let's not forget how many people are rising up all around the world, uh, whether in Belarus or overthrowing a dictator of several decades in Sudan or in, in uh, democracies saying they want better, who are mm -hmm. taking the, the fates of their own societies into their hands, saying that they don't like the return on economic globalization, that they feel inequality has gotten too great or corruption of elites has, has uh, outpaced the ability of institutions to deal with it. There are a lot of things going on in the world apart from China's rise. I, 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 I get it, so, Samantha, but sorry, just, just it, it feels as though we have to check ourselves on, on that particular issue, which is I think that many people living in liberal democracies, and this would have been true prior to the pandemic, but certainly in these pandemic times, would say, why has it hit our society harder? Why has it hit our economy harder? What is it about our decision making that makes us less capable of responding effectively? And so I appreciate the brittleness of those countries you're talking about, but there is a fragility that you've seen in Western democracies that that feels that is real. Yeah, I mean, I would avoid, I, I think going to regime type and making sweeping generalizations is, a bad idea. is I, I think these things have to be parsed. There are plenty of Western democracies or democracies at least uh, in the Pacific, for example, that are doing unbelievably well, including yeah. Taiwan and New Zealand. And until recently, we thought as well that, that uh, Angela Merkel uh, mm -hmm. was, was offering a, a model at least of keeping it in check. This is a really tough uh, pandemic to deal with. And absolutely, China with its ruthlessness had certain advantages, but China with its ruthlessness and culture of fear also is the reason we're having this conversation in the first mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. yeah. because that culture of fear is what impeded the response in the early critical months in which uh, this could have been managed and contained. Yeah, I'm Other sorry, but I yeah. diverted you from the actual, I diverted you from the actual question, which is sort of what then Biden but, does. But I've, I've used up my time and yeah. there are too many other interesting people on the call, but just to say on, I think the core of your question, James, and this gets at, at, uh, at Prime Minister Development's really important point, which is that international engagement in on whatever issue, on climate, on building new international structures to deal with global threats that the old structures aren't fit to deal with, it's going to require much thicker support within democracies than elites in the United States, or I would venture to say in Europe, 
have spent time building uh, right. in the 75 years uh, since the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So I think what you see in Biden's presentation of his climate plan is not a separate climate plan that takes note of the new polling that shows that independents and swing voters actually really care about climate, that this is finally a voting issue, mm -hmm. that the base, of course, is very dedicated to it. Yes, it takes note of all of that, but it is rooted in his economic recovery plan. And right. I think when you see any foreign policy initiative coming out of it, maybe not any, but virtually all of the foreign policy initiatives that come out of the next administration, there's gonna be much more reflection given to how can we frame this as being part of a foreign policy for the middle class? How does what we're doing in institution X or with these alliances matter at home? Because there is a recognition among the many lessons learned by Trump's rise that there was insufficient attention to the home front and to sustaining a constituency for the kind of engagement that we need. Okay, Samantha, thanks. A foreign policy for the middle class is such an interesting idea. Oh, oh, it really is. I, Anna, you were you were um, waving as Samantha was speaking, so I wanted well, to come back to you. It was it was before, but allow me to say my piece on this issue of uh, just the the crisis that we have, and on this again, this is another of the of the basic consensus that we have to establish. We all agree that liberal democracies, and I don't think that even today, uh, United States is more of a mass democracy than many of our European countries. We share the same problems. And the big problem, you, you mentioned that, is the future, mm. especially in Europe. And this has to do with age, with aging societies in particular, with the difficulty with immigration. It, even more so than in the United States. And because of our European construction was well, slipped into prosperity as a late motif. It started because of peace, because of just overcoming feuds that went back centuries, mm -hmm. but it then went into prosperity. The internal market was about prosperity. After the, after the 2008 crisis, this came to a head and, uh, and we have a challenge, of course. Nobody is saying that we don't have a challenge. Now, do we have to, to just get rid of the baby with the bathwater? No, I mean, we, we, what we need, and I think that this is one of the big challenges that we have this side of the pond, but that you Americans, you are, I mean, you are British, I understand, but <laughs> Americans, you are going European on this, you are going European, is that there is this, there is this, uh, we have, you have lost the awareness that freedom doesn't come for free. Yeah. And this is what our populists, your populists, meaning Trump and yeah. our populists are just exploiting, just bringing easy, ready-made solutions to issues that go to our core. Well, so, now, so, 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 and, I, and I, want to, I want to come back to you in a second, but I, I do want to hear, because I, I do want to ask Dominique to follow up because, but, you know, it, so, uh, Anna, sorry, did I interrupt you? Just, no, just, just one sentence on the international architecture, the international institution, institutional and legal architecture. The law is changing. Of course, the meaning of the law, the enforcement of the law, this, all this is, we are in a mutation process. Having said that, I mean, France is always, there is a side of revolutionary just to rebuild, to redo, to remake. I think that we need to reform. We have to make the best out of it. And I think that we can reach critical mass. I don't think that it's 50-50. I think that there are areas where we need to, to be better. Africa, Latin America, we, we haven't paid enough attention and there we we are in competition with the Chinese model. And this autocratic model that is, is attractive in terms of effectiveness. It's even attractive among us. 49% in a, in a reliable survey, 49% uh, of, of Italians would be happy with a strong man provided that this strong man would. So what? we are there, but no, I mean, just rethink, rebuild, re-engage 
and reignite the United States. This is the first thing that we have to do, reignite the United States. So, so Anna, thank you. Uh, I mean, first I have to say, you've opened up potentially a whole other conversation, which is the nature of France, which is a discussion I'm sure we'd all love to participate in, but maybe we'll do that another day. D Dom, <laughs> can, we, can we do do things sort of in two parts, right? You said something really interesting, a new world has to be invented, right? And Anna's point is no, you know, the, the world that we've got has to be reignited. C can you talk about what you think that new world would be? How, what, what, what you would be looking to invent? And then we'll come back to whether or not you can reform and rebuild what we've already got. Well, the, the, the first thing is uh, the world has to be reinvented because we have new partners, new actors, whether we like them or not, but we are in a multipolar world. And if we don't find a way to work with everybody, then we are going to put on the side people that already feel uh, a very strong resentment uh, towards uh, the world community and toward, our, to, toward the world. Uh, this is the case of Russia, it is the case of China, many people and growing number of people in, uh, um, in Africa and in South America. So uh, many emerging countries don't feel that we are enough listening to them and giving them an opportunity to, to play their role. So in my mind, inventing a new world is inventing a world where everybody has the possibility to be part of it and to have its own role. The very manichaeist, the, the way where we put morality at the center of foreign policy might make up each one of us feel nice but it is not efficient. Uh, it is not the way to solve issues. Of course, I strongly believe in the rule of law. I strongly believe in, in human rights. And I think we should find the best way to have this policy being more successful around the world. But at the same time, we need to address many issues that are world issues. Let's take commons issue, like uh, many people say today, peace, uh, culture, environment, uh, these are comments that need to be addressed and we cannot address them alone. We need partnership all around the world. We need to have everybody on board. So the question is, how can we have, of course, a competition on some issues? We are not going to agree uh, on technology, on trade with China, for example. We are not going to agree on uh, human rights. But on other issues, we must find a way to work with them and to have them on board. It was exactly the case that we had in front of us on Iran. On Iran, the world community has been able to get together and to find a way. And then, of course, everything split because of the policy of uh, Donald Trump. How can we rebuild a coalition that helps these countries like Iran, North Korea, to go out of proliferation and to find a way which make them enter in the world community. I believe these questions need to be addressed. Dominic, I'm, I'm going to do it. While you were speaking, I have to confess that Samantha Power was demonstrating a new digital phenomenon, which I would describe as the loud frown. Right? It's a, <laughs> you can almost hear someone frowning. So, 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 Samantha, do you want to just put some words to the frown? I just... I, I feel like it's so much easier to tackle these absolutes, right? Which nobody is proposing. And so a merely moral foreign policy that excludes working with China and Russia, who's for that? Who, 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 where is that <laughs> position being argued for? It's much harder to say in this messy, gritty world where we, by the way, have more conflict happening now around the world than at any point since the end of the Cold War, how do we do a better job helping make peace? And by the way, if we were better at doing mediation and bringing stakeholders to the table and ending contemporary conflict and lowering those numbers, we'd have fewer refugees and migrants. We wouldn't have 80 million people sure. displaced mm -hmm. around the world. If we had fewer migrants, uh, then maybe we'd have different people elected in countries like Hungary or Poland, or maybe we wouldn't have had Brexit or Trump for that matter. So what, you know, this word sort of moral, having a merely moral foreign policy, 
Nobody's talking about that. But Joe Biden's not talking about turning his back on working with Russia. Donald Trump has had no strategic relationship with Russia whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to get one thing done on behalf of the United States and on behalf of the Obama administration at the UN Security Council without getting my Russian counterpart to go along with it. We would have had no big Ebola response. We would have had no, in the end, even, even the Paris Climate Agreement needed Russia to be brought in uh, as, a, as a state party to get it across the finish line. The Iran nuclear deal, Russia did not play spoiler. It was actually a constructive presence in those negotiations. Nobody is claiming that you can simply talk about human rights and that's the extent of your post-Trump foreign policy. But the question is, are there distinguishing features to US leadership? And there certainly when it comes to exercising our voice and standing with people who feel like their governments are denying them their rights, certainly when it comes to standing up against the culture of impunity, which is now so prevalent, both in authoritarian capitalist mm -hmm. countries and in democracies, uh, the United States has to raise its voice in that direction. But that's not the same. So, as so let, let, let's be concrete. For interests. Let's be concrete, uh, tackling concrete issues. What should be the U.S. policy towards Turkey, for example, on Nakhoni Karabakh, on Syria, on um, Eastern Mediterranean? What should be the position? Because we have today no position of the U.S. Well, exactly. You don't have the U.S. position exactly. on anything. I think you'd start so, with an active mediation role uh, when it comes to Nagorno-Karabakh, which is something Mike Pompeo began doing, uh, I think, exactly one week ago after the carnage had already gotten completely out of control. You would also recognize that the country in the, the Gulf region, in the broader Middle East, that people are more worried about even than Iran right now is Turkey. Mm. Uh, so there's actually the possibility of uniting uh, forces. But if you only see Iran, which is all that the Trump administration can see in the broader Middle East, that's going to make that very difficult to do. So we can get into specifics on any. But, but I think that the point is the next president of the United States and all the countries of the world are gonna to have to do two things at once, which, which we really haven't faced. Deal with global threats and global crises requiring truly global cooperation, where you don't have the option of turning your back on working with a country like China or Russia, nor should you. At the same time, we do have countries like China and Russia that are violating the rules of the road and you, there has to be accountability. It can't mm -hmm. just be go along to get along because the very rules that our system uh, depend on are really hanging in the balance in a way that they haven't been since the founding of the UN system in 1945. Samantha, thank you. Um, Two fingers. Yes. Just they, Lynn, I fully agree with this. I think that these maximalist approaches, we need to invent a new world. I mean, the world will not wait for us to invent it. The world is there. It, it's evolving. It's a world in mutation. All these relationships has to have to be adapted to the new world. And uh, I, I mean, there is an area that we haven't discussed because we stand for the rule of law, of course. But the rule of law doesn't even, even the rule of law, this basic principle doesn't mean exactly what it meant in, in 1950 at all. And we, we need to adapt to save the core, to save the principles, and then to be flexible. Nobody is maximalist. I think that realism is a must. Today, you cannot do without realism. And, and I, I, as I say, I think that we mislead the citizens when we tell them that there is an option of the good old days that nobody thinks that we, this is absolutely unthinkable or reinventing the world. No, mm -hmm. we have to, to make the best out of what we have. And we have, of course, to take into account that China is China today. That has nothing to do with China yesterday, among other issues. But I fully agree with, with Samantha. I think that we have to take also responsibility for how we address these middle-income countries, these countries in Africa, in Latin America. Again, I said it before. I think that for both sides of the Atlantic, this Atlantic basin in total is, makes sense. And my bet is that at a certain moment, the world will pivot back from the Pacific to the Atlantic Basin. This is my bet. Today. Well, that, that's, well, well, listen, I want to circle back to, if I might, Anna, because I want to come back to Jim um, in the last few minutes to just talk about US politics and the conduct of American politics in this election, because 
my my instinct is, and this is a bit crude, Jim, that that we in the rest of the world watch U.S. elections play out, think you Americans are crazy, and then discover somewhere between two and four years later that your political practices become ours. So I just wanted to know what you think are going to be the really significant uh, lessons that democracies elsewhere are going to take from this election. Well, it's a great question, and one that you know I say to my clients all the time, James. You have to love him or hate him. You have to look at President Trump and his unbelievable ability to create his own sort of direct to voters conversation. You know, I think it's a horror show on to do foreign policy by Twitter or to manage a pandemic by Twitter, and I think we all agree on that. But what is true is every politician around the world needs to have a, a better understanding of these platforms and these mediums. Um, and, and I think that he is the absolute best at it. Um, he sucks as far as doing the day-to-day -day of his job, but he's the best media communicator I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, and you know, I see this as much internationally as we do in the US, but we have still been unable to figure out in, a West, in Western democracies how to handle fake news and how to handle uh, misinformation. And we continue to see that, especially the American platforms, are unwilling or unable to help us confront this. And the steps they have taken in this election are, are band-aids at best um, and are a serious problem and, you know, I'm working on a presidential campaign right now in Europe and a presidential campaign right now in Africa. And in both places, you see misinformation from uh, other countries and from other organizations happening and no ability to figure out how to deal with it by the social media platforms. And I think that is something that we're all gonna have to, to, to realize. And the third thing, James, is I actually think America should take a cue from Europe on elections. Because this whole spending $4 billion thing and having 18 months of negative TV ads, um, I think uh, Anna has the best system of any of the countries I've worked in, in Spain, 21 days, no paid television ads, um, you know, it, it is their higher turnout, um, you know, I, I think America is because of our Supreme Court decisions is kind of out of control in the money and the length of these campaigns. Um, and it has just become absolutely craziness. And I think we need some return to normalcy, which you guys have in Europe. I'm not sure that the makeup of the Supreme Court is going to help you get there, uh, Jim. But you are correct, sir. Uh, but but can, can I ask you one one other thing? And this is just a final thought from you, Jim. And and I'm ending with you because the truth is, this whole conversation starts with the politics that that play out in the next week. What will be the impact on the nature of democracy that it's not all conducted in a, in a vote on one day? It's not the postal voting or, you know, uh, early voting is new, but, but it is a different thing when it's clear that the better part of 100 million Americans have already voted by the time the polls open on election day. And what impact do you think that will ha have on the conduct of campaigns? I think it's wonderful. And I think it's one of the best things that's happened to us, you know, in, in, in crisis, there's opportunity. And the fact that we now have, you know, the problem in American politics, and this is true all over the world, is you can have October surprises. You can have one issue really move the polls at the very end. We saw this in the US with the James Comey thing in 2016. And a longer election allows people to really take information in and allows higher participation. We're gonna have the highest participation of our generation uh, on Tuesday. And that is very good for democracy. That is very good for the fact that more people are interested in participating. And part of that is Americans actually made it easier to vote. And I think if the pandemic gave us anything good, it's the fact that we now are gonna have elections that go on for longer and have more people vote because they can do it on election day. Or they don't have to wait till election day. Well, listen, th th thank you. Um, we had a conversation. Uh, normally, um, those who know me will know that uh, I, 
I interrupt even more than uh, normally today, but that's because there's so much to listen to. And I can't help feeling that as much as we look at 2020 as a year that is unbelievably traumatic and challenging, it is like this conversation, also one that fundamentally tests our thinking and gives us a chance to, you know, to your point, Dominique, to think about imagining a new and different world rather than a reversion to the one that we were we were in before and when so many people like me think oh we really need more global leadership to have a conversation like this where you hear ideas a grasp of the detail and above all passion uh, passion uh, it's a it's a wonderful and invigorating uh, thing to hear so a heartfelt thank you to you Anna Palacio to you Samantha Power Dominic de Vilpa and Jim Messina I hope those of you who are in this weekly get together of the Santander International Banking Conference will join us uh, for our final session um, uh, next week when Anna Botin, the executive chairman of Santander will be with us, uh, Nadia Calvino, who's the vice president of Spain uh, for the uh, economy and digitalization, uh, Larry Fink, who is the um, chairman and chief executive of BlackRock and uh, uh, the professor and thinker Yasha Munk will be with us too, uh, Yasha's from Johns Hopkins. It will be a fascinating conversation. Um, it will have a lot to live up to in being uh, half as fascinating as this one. Uh, a big thanks to all four of you and thank you everyone for listening. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.